You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. So what do you do in your downtime? I fish. (laughs) That's pretty much it. Like, I mean, do you like just go out in the same place by yourself or are you just scouting the whole time when you go? No, I'm always looking for different places. So it's uh, a lot of times it's a bust because I'm going places where uh, I'm just looking for stuff. I'll go places okay. where I normally wouldn't go, you know, and just uh, and just try. But honestly, it's how you also like find really cool places too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, like uh, tomorrow, I don't have a trip, so I'll go out tomorrow and um, I'll probably go somewhere up. Uh, close to Point of Rocks. There's a place up there that I want to go. There's some islands that I'll try to fish around. How how crazy was the traffic on the river this past weekend? It was bad on the Susquehanna. Really? Yeah. Yeah. There was um, uh, all kinds of boats out there. One guy looked like he was doing 100 miles an hour on the river. Oh, my God. One of those um, uh, speed boats that have a, a car engine in it, you know? Mm-hmm. You could hear it from miles away. Yeah, I know the type you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wonder yeah. how many kayakers he actually ran over in tubers. I don't know. I mean, he was going so fast. I, uh, it was crazy. Uh, the The Potomac wasn't that bad. That's because I think um, it's real shallow, so people don't go out there. Gotcha. It was registering yeah. under um, under three feet. Under uh, three feet. Dang. Yeah, at the Edwards Ferry Gauge, so it's uh, it's super low on the um, on the Point of Rocks Gauge. So let's see here. Yeah, so right now it's reading two nine, and on um, let's go upstream, and the uh, Point of Rocks Gauge is reading one foot, one point zero nine feet. That's insane, but we haven't gotten a lot of rain either. No. Not much at all. Um, the water's real clear. It's um, it's low, but it's clear. It's cooling down, though, because, you know, the um, uh, days are getting shorter and the nights are getting longer. So it really doesn't matter. Um, I mean, we'll still get some warm days, but uh, the water will get forced to, uh, the you know, the temperature will drop out on it. But the, I can tell you the water on the Susquehanna River is 77 degrees, and the water on the Potomac River is, um, you know, uh, give or take 80 or 81 degrees. How come? Why the, climate, you the climate's completely different up there than it is here. It's cooler up there. What is that? Like a fifth, a hundred miles? miles? Yeah. yeah the, the weather up there is weird. The, the joke is that the guys that fish up there, they say, you think the weather's bad now? Wait 15 minutes. Yeah, no, I, I can believe that too. Yeah. Like, especially once you get closer to like late September, October ish area where it can get cold real quick. Yeah, the, um, I've seen the weather turn up there real quick. Um, was it the Susquehanna or was it the Potomac? I saw one day where it rained, it snowed, it sleeted, it was windy, and then it stopped. It was sunny. It was cloudy. It was bad. That's the fishing was good though. How many days? Of, how many days are you usually up at the Susky? Um, one or two. Okay, I go up there. And then um, I'm on the Potomac River. Um, I mean, I, I prefer the Potomac River. I like the Susquehanna River. But um, it's just like anyone that lives there, they would prefer the Susquehanna River. It's their, it's their home water, so to speak, you know? Susky's also, at least right now, it's still it's still pumping out some insane bags. Oh, sure. Yeah. I was at, um, I went out of Goldsboro and uh, the fishing wasn't that hot. Um, it, it was real, uh, it, was, it was loaded with grass. You know, the Goldsboro is, uh, uh, it looks like a lake. It's backed up by the, um, by the, uh, the dam. And, um, it's, it's easy to get around on because the water is a little bit deeper and, uh, you don't have to worry about, um, uh, you don't have to worry about boating safety as much. Goldsboro. Like you, it would be like a pinball machine if you went out of, um, Dun, Dun Cannon. Let's Some of those see. guys can probably run that stuff up there. So here's but, uh, the dam. Yeah, which what, what where's Goldsboro? This is the dam right here in the Susquehanna. 
So I'm assuming it's up, up here. Go up to where the uh, power plant is. There's another dam system as well. Oh, there is? Yeah, I believe there's two. You got the Conowingo Dam. All right, so here's the second dam. This is the the Holtwood Dam. All right, go up. Dang, there's a lot of dams on this. Oh, my God, there's like three dams. Damn. Yeah. Oh, Clark Lake. No. Here we are. Keep going at up. 30. Good Lord. <laughs> I can wherever you can like, find Goldsboro. PA. Goldsboro, PA. Sits right on the water. Is it at College Park? College Park is probably too far. Yeah, it's that's way too far. New Buffalo? Keep going down. Buffalo? Down? Yeah, keep going down. Zoom that map in for me a little bit if you could. Boom. How's that? Yep. And keep heading down. Uh, wherever Harrisburg is, go south of that. Oh, there's City Island right there, right? Yeah, we're right at yep. Harrisburg. Yeah, keep going down. There's Goldsburg. Yep, and there's the power plant right there. I see it. Oh, damn. Yeah, so right in there. Now, is this generally where you launch out of when you actually go to this part of the river? No, this is only where I go when the water's super low. Okay. Now, it's are very you doing... Safe. It's, it's very safe to run. Now, are you doing cat fishing trips out of here, smallmouth fishing trips, or both? No, just just small, just, just small mouth. Just small mouth? Yeah, but I, I saw a sign for, for anyone that... Um, I didn't look, hasn't looked at the billboard or is thinking about going out of Goldsboro. I saw, uh, there's a sign that's on the, you know, boat ramp billboard, but it's a small, it's just a regular piece of paper. And it says that they're going to be doing, um, dam work until hmm. October 10th, I think it was. And they're going to have to lower the water levels. Oh, wow. And then I don't know if they raised the, I don't know if they shut the dam, closed it because the water level this past weekend wasn't consistent with what Air Harrisburg said. The water okay. was higher than it should have been. And I think the dam was closed or or, or they, they uh, shut it off a little bit more than usual. Do you ever fish the tail races of these dams? Where at? Uh, on, the, on the Susquehanna River. No. Because I know like... You mean, on, you mean on the, the, um, the, below the dams? Yeah. Um, I, I, I have down in a place called Peach Bottom. Um, there's a power plant down there and that's, that's further South. Um, it's, uh, it's where Maryland and Pennsylvania are. God, these are, this river is massive. It's insane. And I've, I've done that before. I can tell you that water down there and they're kind of wingo. That water down there seemed real dangerous. There's like whirlpools and everything in it. I mean, the world water's just swirling around. It's deep. And that's because of the power plant down there, the, the really? pushing water out. Yeah. Well, now I know if you go way down, let me zoom out a little bit, right here where the river kind of dumps into the upper bay, below yeah. this dam right here can be like really good, especially for like the smallmouth fishing. Um, yeah, that's what they call the Susquehanna fish. Flats, right? Yeah, that's the Susquehanna Flats. And yep. they actually have a Bassmaster Open coming here pretty yep. soon. But I if you I look at that. this, it's just like a giant fishbowl. And mm -hmm. you have like the Elk River, the Northeast River, and the Susquehanna dumping into here. And it's just like a massive freaking grass flat. It's nuts. And so mm -hmm. you can go out there and it's usually better on like, hey, everyone, Fishing the DMV is a fast growing business with thousands of viewers each week listening in to this show. And in 2023, we're looking to expand and grow our business. And in order to do that, we need to bring on some sponsors. If your business is interested or you know someone that might be interested in sponsoring Fishing the DMV, please reach out to me at fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Again, that's fishingthedmv at gmail.com. We're looking for a couple of unique sponsors to come on and help us grow this business in 2023. A, a downtide when the tide's pulling out, it's just a carpet of grass, vegetation. Oh, and so really? You really? Yeah. And so you really need to figure it out because there's there's not a lot of visual cues for it. So it is about just fishing through it, you know, hours and hours and hours until you kind of find the juice. But when this place gets bad, or any of these grass areas, you can run back up into like 
the Susky right here. Um, and you can fish it. And actually my brother and I fit, qualified for a national championship back out here. Cause the, the tide was just, it was crap. It was a bad tide. We had a bluebird day. The wind was blowing up, up river. And so we mm-hmm. said, screw the large mouth. Let's just go straight after the small mouth. And so we just went into the Susky and we, and we limited out with like 10 pounds, but it was enough to get us a spot. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. Um, so uh, I hear a lot of people talk about that place. Yeah, it, it really, it really is a the deal. So, um, yeah, like, what did you want to? Uh, anything in particular you want to cover today besides the um, the Upper Potomac? Is there anything new going on with your website? Yeah, uh, the uh, uh, SWFA baits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have uh, I have some new uh, new products on there. I've got some reels that um, some uh, reels for sale right now. They're the um, uh, Daiwa Tatulas, two thousand to twenty five hundred series reels. Um, I'm adding some more stuff this, uh, this fall. I'm going to have, um, lucky craft lures available. Nice. Um, uh, preferably I'm going to be selling the, uh, suspending jerk baits, but I'll probably have some, uh, crank baits as well, but okay. the, uh, suspending jerk baits will be the 78s and the one hundreds. The pointers. Sweet. That's fantastic. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, and I'll, be, make- I'll be able to sell those at the uh, same price that any of the, uh, big giant competitors like, tackle warehouse and um bass pro and stuff so my, my, my prices are very competitive fantastic that's really awesome um yeah. so let's hit that um do you have a technique we could go over this time as well like uh your technique that you like to throw this time of year um yeah right now i've been catching fish with the uh slider head slider head um, slider head from charlie brewer it's not much of a technique it's just a jig head but a lot of people don't really know about it or don't think much about it and I, I put those three inch um uh Cinco's on there, the ones I make, the SWFA uh stick baits. Uh okay. they're three inches. And um I throw those and those have been working really well right now, along with uh Ned Rigs. Sweet. So if you want, let's before we get started here, if you want to grab a couple of the slider heads to show off, and if you could turn a light on since you're starting to get really, really dark. Oh yeah? Okay. Let me see. Let me turn one on first. How about that? No? Yeah? Oh, much better. Perfect. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That looks great. I don't want to look like I'm coming down from the uh, the heavens with all that light. I don't want you to look like you're in the witness protection agency either or your whole face is blacked out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, hold on. Let me get get some of them uh, hooks. So what I'm using is um, the same tackle, you know, the uh, medium light or medium rod, seven foot. The um, On the medium lights, I usually have a a 1,000 series reel with – 1,000 or 2,000 series reel with um, braid, 25 pound, the gamma fluorocarbon. That, I mean, I'm sorry, gamma braid that I sell, the torque. Nice. And then um, I'm using the um, fluorocarbon. Right now I'm using Sunline. It's called Sunline Sniper. I th- I th- I've showed it before on here. Mm-hmm. But I also have um, the, the gamma um, fluorocarbon as well a- available. Um, and none of these places that I'm talking about, I, I-, I want to I make it clear that um, – they don't sponsor me. I'm selling these these uh, these products. I use them. I use them in my guide service. So right on. this isn't a pitch for a sponsorship or anything like that. I just sell. I sell these products. Um, but and and I trust them 100. percent So for the medium light, what I told you, the 25 pound gamma, I find that's better than 20, and and you don't need to go any more than 30 because uh, it, it helps with the uh, line not nodding up. You know, for people when they're when they're casting, have you ever seen that in a reel in a spinning reel? Yeah. Every so often it'll do it. It's a pain in the butt. But um, and then my uh, fluorocarbon leader on the medium light is about a rod's length, seven foot. Oh wow! You know, roughly seven feet, and um, I'm using eight pound. You can use anywhere between six and ten, but I like eight. Okay. And if if well, all I have available is ten pound, I'll use ten. And I'm tying these. Uh, these Charlie Brewer slider heads. They're right here. They're called, they're the spider, um, uh, model right here. These are the 16th ounce. I don't want to pull them out of the back, but you can see the heads pretty good. These are the 16th. And then here's the eighth. And I'll tell you, there's a big difference in the eighth and the 16th with them getting snagged in the river. What do you like about the slider head compared to a Texas rig? 
Well, it 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 rigs just like a Texas rig. But what I like about it, it just um it can't they, they just flat out catch fish. I like how it sinks. When it goes in, it goes in real um uh, uh, it's got a real finesse look to it, you know. It comes it out that in. angle. Yeah. Now, and, um, do you use super glue with that? No, I don't. Uh, I have, and uh, I just don't have any right now. But that's a uh, great um, addition to these soft plastics because uh, the smallmouth just rip them off. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the more um, uh, frustrating things is when they rip the tails off a brand new bait that you just put on the hook. You know, and, and expect, it, it, yeah. it renders it useless uh, unless they're biting you really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, you're gonna have to switch switch out because that that paddle tail is probably what, uh, you know, for, for certain baits that have paddle tails like swim baits, it's probably what's uh, causing them to hit it. Dude, especially with bluegill right now, like when you're fishing oh, yeah. that little swim bait, man, they just destroy plastic, especially little swim baits. Mm -hmm. Oh, like, they're, they're yeah, they were up on the, in Goldsboro, they're ripping off. Uh, tails like what like it was cool it, it's insane and that's like one reason like for like the nedrick stuff i know everyone has their own opinion on which nedrick bait to use but the reason yeah. i like elastec so much is like dude they can't strip it like when i've used other versions which there are different there are other good ones on the market mm -hmm. man they just will tear the bait up to just to snot it's crazy yeah i'll be um i'll be offering too this fall on uh, my next order to to uh, um from a uh, distributor uh z-man z-man um neds Nice and um and the the jig heads that come with them. I like using the jig heads that come with them. You know, like the the name brand Z Man with the Z Man mm -hmm. bait. I just I just feel like they they stay on the hook better. Yeah, but, and, and and there's so many different ones. And guys, if you want to know, yeah. I'll, I'll link a description up above me right here. I've been playing around with some different jig heads because I like a I like a a nice weed guard too. Sometimes I feel like I mm -hmm. I prefer. Z-mans, but when you're facing those really, really rocky terrain, when it's a little bit higher water, I like to go with a more of like a jig style head, just because I feel like I don't get snagged up as much. Um, Z-man offers a uh, hook that's similar to a uh, slider head, and it's called oh. a bullet hook, huh. and it and it rigs like it Texas rigs. Okay. Yeah, hold on. Let me grab that. Um, let me grab one of these hooks. I'll show you what I mean. No, that's really cool, guys. Let me show you one of my hooks that I like real quick. I should have grabbed one um, before, but here. So here's that um, here's that jig head. I've, I've showed it before, I believe. There it here's is. that slider head. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Let's see here. And then let me show you mine. So then this is uh, so this right here is a a heavy yep. weed guard net head right here. Oh which wow. Is, yeah. I'll send you a link to this in the private chat, but like something like that, what's nice about that is if you're fishing a little bit heavier current or heavier cover guys, you can get away with heavier line and throw that thing. Um, and it's a super light finesse hook um, on and that then, bad boy. And then you rig it. I just rig it yep. fast. We're rigging it just like this. Oh, dude, that is really nice. And then when it goes in, you can kind of see how it's going to, it's going to go Dark in the water down. like this. Yeah. Now, how big of a, um, how big of a head, oh, I'm sorry, how big of a, hook, a fit, blah, blah, blah. this is where you need coffee, guys. How big of a worm are you using there? Is that a three inch? Oh, diameter? that's a three inch. Yeah. Oh yeah. That okay. bad boy's three inches. Just gonna say, these are, okay. these are what oh. I call SWFA stick baits. What color are you throwing? Green pumpkin. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, there's, there's three colors I like. Green pumpkin, uh, a black with a gold flake. I call that uh, SWFA custom. And then a brown, like a brown pumpkin. If you can picture a brown pumpkin, and you know, sometimes mm. green pumpkin kind of looks brown as well, but yeah. a brown color. And if those three colors aren't working, we have problems. <laughs> well, I mean, like, you know? but what's so crazy about smallmouth fishing too is like, so if you're if you're doing a large if you're fishing a largemouth reservoir or a tournament, usually you think the Ned rig is like, okay, you're gonna throw this when all else fails. But with smallmouth fishing, especially river, like that's your primary bait right now is mm -hmm. throwing some kind of like Ned rig variation. Is there anything else right now that you're throwing or is that primarily what you're giving your customers? The three inch, uh, pla the, the three inch uh, stick bait, the Ned that I make, I'm, I'm throwing that as well on a, um, a 16th ounce to eighth ounce, uh, jig head. Um, and, uh, and it's weedless. It's a finesse hook. It's it's just like this, but if you can picture a uh, a mushroom head on it, mm -hmm. and you can you can uh, Texas rig it. Okay. Um, and I'm also throwing these quarter ounce 
spinner baits. And the brand on this one, it's it's white too, by the way. So it that's what that's what color it is when you're uh the, the lighting isn't really good where I am. Oh nice. But this uh quarter ounce spinner bait right here. It's a war eagle spinner bait. What um what type of blade was on there? Because it is it a Colorado or is it an Indiana? Uh, I would call it a Colorado. What do they call them? Turtlebacks or something like that, too. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you said it's three right, anything that's oval to me like this, I just consider it a Colorado blade. And then see up here, this little one. This little one is more of a Colorado blade, I guess. Gotcha. And then now um uh I also do willow leaves, but um this one seems to work very well in, in slow, clear water in the summertime. Now, how are you, how are you asking your clients to present that? Are they burning it back to the boat? Are you having them slow roll it? Um, fish it as fast as you can. Uh, just as fast as you can. So you can see it. You know okay. what I mean? When you throw it's just under the surface, uh, probably six inches and bring it back. And then I tell them that you can, uh, once you get comfortable with, with casting it, you can stop it and start it again, but just keep it up in the water column so it doesn't snag something. But I mean, spinner baits are really hard to get snagged. Yeah. And um, I'll tell them you can um, consistently reel it, you know, back, like I said, so you can always see it at the sur uh, below the surface so you can see strikes and then you can, you can kill it. You can start it again, uh, pop it, you know, like you're, um, like you're trying to get it off a snag or something, hit it real quick, make the blades flutter, you know, make the blades do something like this and start falling and then, and then pick it up and start um, fishing it again. Yeah. I know when I fish a jerk, uh, when I fish a spinner bait, I'll sometimes fish it like a jerk bait. And when I get closer to the boat, what I'll do is I'll, I'll actually jerk the rod tip a couple of times just to try to get that skirt to flail a little yeah, bit to see yeah. if you get a reaction strike with you it. You want it to flare. And then I also tell them um, to throw it out. And before you get it, before you start reeling it, pop it a couple of times and get that, that, uh, spinner bait to kind of do this in the water a little bit b before it just starts, uh, fluttering through. When do you like to throw a spinner bait versus a chatter bait versus a crank bait? Cause those are the three that I really think of that are sometimes interchangeable. Uh, usually they are. Spinner... Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying like, usually a spinner bait is you think like cold water, you think early in the year, springtime, that's what yeah. a lot of people are throwing it, but you're using it here in the summertime. Like talk about that. What, why? This is th Well, this is a quarter ounce. This thing's tiny. Okay. This thing's ridiculous looking. I mean, it's small. Um, I mean, this will even catch bluegill from time to time. Wow. Um, and then I'll also use something smaller. You ever seen beetle spins? Yeah. Beetle old spins school, man. <laughs> and put an eighth ounce jig head on there. Um, you know, you can buy them at like Walmart, uh, places like that. You can probably get them on Amazon. Uh, I'm going to probably start selling them. And, you know, this year before the year's um, year ends, I'll have them available. But um, buy them, the eighth ounce ones, because they come with a certain size blade. I don't know exactly what size the blade is. One or a two, it's called. Okay. And, um, and then just swap out the uh, uh, the little plastic bait that comes with it with just a regular eighth ounce jig head and put like a gulp minnow on it hmm. and swim it back. They'll that crush those. Deadly. You catch, you'll, cr you'll catch really big smallmouth with such a small spinner. Uh, it has to be. Is it because they're keying in on such small bait? Yeah, they, they do. Uh, and, then, and then sometimes you'll see one with some horrendously large you know minnow in its mouth when you catch it um yeah it, but I, I think they prefer just eating small baits i i think so too um and especially if you're thinking about where the river that we're on the potomac versus i don't know the the new river or if you're thinking of the saint lawrence river or the susquehanna where they're probably keying on bigger things like i know the rusty crayfish is a big thing on the susquehanna river system and and the new Those river believe it or not right they're they're massive. I'll actually try to get a picture yeah. of them up, but they're absolutely huge. But like a goby is pretty big too. They can get about mm -hmm. four or five inches, but they get very thick. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was, actually was going to ask you about this too. If you've actually seen something like this before out on the river, let me, let me share this image real quick. So we have something right on here. the river. We have something on the river called a mad tom, which is a type of catfish, and it's real small. It gets like can get like three or four inches long. I guess you can kind of 
I guess it kind of resembles a goby as well, but it's a catfish that lives under rocks and stuff. The Mad Tom is something people don't really talk about in the mainstream, uh, but it's yeah. such a freaking deadly bait to be throwing. Yeah, they, they really like them. They, uh, I, I catch them uh, throughout the year um, quite often in the um, in the fall and summer. You'll see um, the Mad Toms in their in their throats, and the really? way you know it's it's a Mad Tom Mad Tom is because of the um, the tail is like a butter knife. Hmm. You know, there's no like regular looking fin. It's not like a regular fish fin. It's kind of like a butter knife, like a, like really? a bow fin. You ever seen a bow fin fish? Yeah, or like a snakehead's back back of his tail. Yeah, mm-hmm. something like that. So yeah, look at this face. This is a guy that was actually like scuba diving with him. I don't know if you can see this. I'll blow up the screen a little bit. So this right here is he's actually snorkeling in the river. Oh, that's cool. Is is and that's what he thinks. I think that's a mad tom that he's like recording right now. No, they're, I don't know. Hard to say. But like, you can tell like the size profile there because that's a small type of catfish. But it can kind of show you like when they're rooting around the bottom, a mad tum is probably way more easy to catch for a smallmouth than probably a crayfish. I mean, they must whack those things too. When they hit oh, them, they oh, must absolutely. just nail them. Absolutely. And, and they do, like you're right, like they have that goby profile. And that's why I think that's why I think a Ned rig works so freaking well compared to a tube sometimes. Is I think a Ned rig mimics a mad tom way better than a tube. I think a tube is a really good crayfish imitator, but I could be wrong, but that's my hypothesis. Well, a Ned rig too falls differently than this uh than this jig head that I that I showed. Than this um uh slider head. It falls differently, it just falls straight down. And then mm-hmm. depending on the weight. I think the the way it, the fall rate triggers strikes. I, yeah, I mean, so I'm too. usually around the 16th ounce, the eighth ounce, uh, and then there's one in between 16th and eighth, and I forget the um, I forget what it's um, the size, but uh, somewhere around there, they, they it'll tr- it'll trigger a strike sometimes when these uh, just don't because they're they're falling a different way. Gotcha, gotcha. No, I think that's so important for people to understand because it's about gr- generating that core reaction strike. Whether you're burning a spinner bait, using a slider head, using a regular Ned head, going to me where I go with that three eighth ounce head in the heavy current because it'll just drop down really quickly. Just trying mm-hmm. different things to get that reaction strike because a lot of times that's what you need to do to get a couple more bites in a day. Yeah, um, and then I use the eighth ounce. Uh, I've been catching fish. I, I feel like they work better when the water's over 80 degrees, but we're talking about different plastics and stuff. And this is, this is basically a, I mean, all these baits I'm showing you, I guess could, could, uh, uh, you know, qualify as Ned rigs because they're so small, but I think it's usually anything under, over, under three inches, right? Would you consider a Ned rig? Pretty this, much. I'm- yeah. This right here. See this thing? That thing is so. I call it an SWFA bug. Looks like a a a massive centipede. (laughs) Yeah, it's only um, what is it? Three inches, three and a half inches. It's on my website. It it, it'll tell you how long. Uh, I I believe it's three and a half. And I put an eighth ounce slider head on that. There's hardly any meat on this thing. There's no plastic on it. Yeah, you need a little bit more weight to get it out there. And I'll tell you what, over eighty degrees, they just they seem to key in on this thing and crush it. So what type of hook do you like to throw with that thing? Is that on a regular like EWG style hook or are you throwing that on that slider head? Just on the slider head. These are like, uh, these are uh, one aughts, I believe. One aughts? Yeah. One aught wow. hooks. Right? Now, yeah. Yeah. Now, this time of year, it, it depending on where you are, it can be really finicky, especially when we talk lake fishing. I'm going to have a live stream coming out here soon where I talk about how to find fish in the lake during this transition period. But rivers act a little bit differently. To the audience at home, can you talk to them about, like, does the river go through massive changes like lakes do, or is it pretty dependable when it comes to going out and catching fish? You mean this time of year, like when you hear people talk about lakes turning over at some point in time? Yeah. Uh, I don't feel like the rivers the river does... The, uh, the, the fish just move. They move around. They stop, uh, let's say they, they stop hanging out um, at certain areas, certain rocks, certain, certain uh, structure, and they move to other structure. Like recently, I've been finding largemouth on the river on this one tree 
that's just laying in the, uh, laying on the Maryland side of the river and the water can't be more than two and a half feet. And there's, uh, there's large mouth in there that are, um, pound and a half to two and a half pounds. And they're, um, and they're striking like Ned rigs and, um, uh, other types of, um, you know, larger Cinco baits, like four inch Cinco's and stuff. It's real strange. And then the small mouth will just, th they'll move from sections of the river and go somewhere else. Why do you think the, the, the large mouth moved in? I don't know. I, I guess the, the food, I mean, there, there's got to be some type of food, uh, food source there. There's a lot of minnows around there. I can't really figure out the largemouth on the upper Potomac river. Other than I know if we're in certain, certain areas and it's like cold in the colder months, there's a good chance we could catch a real big largemouth. When I say big, I mean over four pounds. Dang. Yeah. So then if, if you're looking at this thing right here, we're going to bring this up just so everyone else at home can like, just, just stay tuned here. And yeah, this is a, a segment everybody really loves. So I'm going to keep bringing it back. Um, so guys, this is just a random picture I took of yeah. river. I, it's not the um, upper Potomac, but if you look at this right now, generally speaking, when you're fishing this thing in the summertime, everyone's thinking about hitting the riffles. You're hitting that, that main short, fast water kind of areas. Yeah. Now that we're getting into September, now that we're having the, this this cool down period, where are the fish going to be going? Well, you probably are, find them. Are they still in keep, this area right in here? Yeah, they're still there where the white water, you see where the white water is? Yeah. And right those ripp uh, ripples. Um, but they'll also be, this time of year I find them, um, above those, just above those rocks. Really? On the, um, uh, the uh, upside of the river. Yeah, up there, but just tucked in. Um, just above them, above the ripples. The ripples. So, what they're, so what they're doing is they're basically sitting up here above the current break, getting ready to ambush whatever comes down. Yeah. And if they're there and if, if, if you're finding fish and consistently in, uh, let's say three or four different spots and you're getting hit and catching fish, they mean business are up. If they're up there, they're really? not playing around. They're going to nail anything that comes in there. And I'll tell you, if you get a good bite like that, you can throw those small spinner baits. Oh, no okay. Yeah. That's where those come in. Yeah. Now the largemouth though, the largemouth aren't going to be there. So you're saying the largemouth are more right here near yeah. all the wall and wood and stuff. Yep. And then I'll find concentrations of largemouth throughout the, um, uh, late fall into winter in certain areas where there's, uh, just debris piled up. Um, I found them on the, um, near the, in the Monocacy river. I found them just in different stretches of the uh, Potomac, but they're always on the shorelines hmm. and they're, and you know, usually I would say 90% of the time, there's always a Creek nearby within a hundred, 200 yards. So they want that fresh water flow. Yeah. They, they want somewhere. I think that they can duck into whenever the water gets real high because they do not like current. Now, with, with that said, are you trying when you're taking customers out, are you trying to pattern the largemouth? Like you said, that's a little bit harder. Are they more of like a, a nice surprise catch when you catch them? Are you more no, of a smallmouth? No, if, if, if I know they're in a certain spot, I'll take, I'll take people to them and okay. see if we can, uh, we can, um, if, if they're still going to cooperate or if they've been there, if I've taken people there two days in a row and we caught a couple and then the third day, who, who knows if they'll cooperate, but, uh, I keep going back as long as the, uh, the water, uh, the conditions are, basically the same what right now is the hardest thing going into the fall for your job of locating the fish is it something where you, you're running and gunning as much as you used to do in the spring is it or let me rephrase the question is this the hardest time of year to locate them i i feel like this year it is um on the potomac river uh you'll find a group of them here and then there'll be areas where the river just just doesn't really have very many fish doesn't have a concentration of them and you have to go another mile up the river and you'll find some more uh, but i'm still finding them around structure rocks in the middle of the river how long do they usually stay in these areas is this something where you have to constantly refine them or are they staying for a yes. couple days at a time no mm -hmm. um depending if the, if, if the water if the water i can tell you this on the potomac river i feel like if um let's say we have uh a water level, let's just let's just make something up. We have a water level that's three and a half feet at the Edwards Ferry Gauge. That water level uh, drops out and goes to three feet. They'll be completely different places. Wow. Six inches, 
three inches, even three inches of water, it seems like it moves them. Mm. And it's very frustrating. They're just not there anymore. Hmm. Doesn't mean they're not going to come back to those spots. So it sounds like they're moving a lot. They're chasing bait. They're trying to get fattened up for the winter, but they're still very catchable. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something for people at home to really take away. When you see everybody online and YouTubers talking about like, this is a really hard time of year to catch fish. What they generally are talking about are ponds and lakes. When lakes go through this turnover period, especially if there's tons of vegetation. So if you're fishing Lake Gunnersville or like Okeechobee or any of those grassy lakes, the fall can be a pain in the ass. Cause as the days get shorter, the nights get longer, the vegetation starts to die off and those fish have to reposition. Uh, and then eventually they'll start chasing bait, getting into their fall patterns. But this is the time of year that the tournaments are one going up into the river system. When Ot Defoe, you know, had a jet boat or when he had a tunnel hall and he would just leave Lake Douglas, Lake Douglas and go straight up into the river system. This is the most consistent fishing, generally speaking. And so if you want to go out, uh, have a great day going out with Jeff, this is, I think, the time of year that you will outfish most lakes in the country. Jeff, you think it's a safe, safe assessment? Yeah. Um, when the water starts getting cooler, too. Yes. 100%. Because the bites are going to be better. Getting- yeah, there'll be days where we go out and uh, you can do no wrong. <laughs> I mean, you mm. can fish a bait completely wrong and they're going to whack it. You could throw a spinner bait when you don't even need to throw a spinner, or when a spinner bait probably isn't the thing to throw, and you'll get one to hit it. That's so freaking cool. So then, like, walk us through really the river right now. Like, uh, for your guide service, where are you really concentrating right now? Or how does um, the river look? It looks good. I'll tell you, down around Seneca, Seneca Creek. You know, have you ever heard of that? Riley's Lock, Seneca Creek. That's down by Dam 2, if anyone wants to look for it. It's just above Violet's Lock. It's uh, the first area on the Pot- Upper Potomac River where you can start putting boats in. Right. Go down to uh, right around um, Poolsville. Yeah, is that, is that it right there? Zoom in on that. Seneca Creek right it's here. Saint Seneca. Yeah, right there. That place is just matted up with grass. Grass really? everywhere. So you want to go north of that, unless you're in a canoe or a kayak where you can kind of uh, creep up the shoreline and find open areas and start fishing the, um, the grass, the edges of the grass uh, with spinner baits. And um, I guess uh, chatter baits might work, but spinner baits are working. And so are plastic baits. What does the vegetation really do to, to how the fish position? Are the smallmouth positioning in the grass or is it more of like a largemouth deal? What, what is that like fishing? No, they're, the, um, the, the, the smallmouth like patrol the edges of it. Okay. And, uh, I mean, you'll see them darting in and out of it, but they're, they're, uh, I think they use it for ambush points. Mm. They don't like want to stay in it like a largemouth would, you know? Okay. Um, Interesting. they just kind of use it as, uh, a way to feed. Um, and like I said, they, they just, it almost seems like they patrol those, uh, those grass beds. Where the hell is They're this? not just sitting in one little location. Oh, that's the W no trail. That's what that is. Okay. Gotcha. That's what that is. Got it. Yeah. That's a, a body of water just, um, on the other side. Um, yeah. So you want to go up river and that first Island right there, uh, is probably where the, uh, the grass is going to stop. Um, if you're in a jet boat, I mean, you got to be real careful this time of year on where you're going, because even though you can run in a foot, foot or less of water, if you get into grass, that's on the, uh, sh- uh, on the surface of the, of the river, on the surface of the water, and you start sucking in grass, your boat's going to come off plane and you're going to hit the bottom mm. and you'll hit rocks that you normally wouldn't hit. So you have to be aware of where you're going. So just to make sure for the, for everybody at home watching. So you're saying from, from Sharpshin Island down towards the dam area, that's just chock full of grass. There's a lot of grass in there. Yeah. Now what does that do and to like the bait fish population though? It's gotta be chock full oh, of bait. Oh yeah. They're hiding in it, man. They're everywhere. There's bait fish that are an inch big, probably tinier than that to three, three and four inch. Uh, I don't know what, I don't know what its size you would consider a uh, fingerling. But you'll see fingerlings swimming around too. Oh, I dude, guess they're that's about awesome. four or five inches. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So we keep so we keep going up. Yep. And then... and up uh, and the water's so low right now. Hey, right there where your uh, where your cursor is, in that section of the river, that water right there, you could probably walk across that water right now, and it'll never go above your kneecap. Dude, you All have. 
you have some stones. How the hell do you get like, I don't know how you do that in jet boat. Like, I know you're not going to hit, but just the feeling of like, you're driving over basically a parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, I went through some water. I've been going through water, uh, recently on the Potomac. That's, that's, I don't know, four or five inches, but I go through it. And I, I, I know that it's just a flat bottom. Yeah. And, and I get it. Like you've done it so much. Like you probably don't think about it at all, but how many people do you have on your boat that feel like they're finding Jesus when you like, just go yeah, yeah, they're probably, there. <laughs> yeah, they're probably like, Holy crap. Hopefully this guy knows what he's doing, at least in the boat. Uh, yeah. This is how we're actually going to die. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I, I just, I, I don't know. I'd have to get used to really running like that. So then, okay. Going from there, it's ankle deep water. Are you just trying to find all the deeper pools connected to riffles then? Yeah. Yep. I wouldn't even fish that area right now where, where I just told you it was, uh, not deeper than your, uh, kneecap. And then, uh, just keep going up and you'll find, you'll find areas where the water, when the water's this slow, you'll find areas where it looks, you can see the bottom. It's real clear. And then you'll get dark green areas in the, in the river and like depressions in the river. They don't even have to be that big. And then it'll hold small mouth, especially some that have, uh, rocks in it, large rocks. How good are the pilings of the, all the bridges that are on the Potomac River this time of year? I don't really fish them. I just kind of get through there. Yeah, you're up around Brunswick right there. Yep. Um, I mean, you got to have, uh, you got to really feel like you know what you're doing if you get up around where that bridge is right now. Because I, I don't even think uh, I don't even think there's ankle deep water there going all the way across. So th that's a good point for our audience. Like for like the people like to wade fish this time of year. Um, is there still fishing opportunities this far up the river before Harper's Oh Ferry? yeah, man! Right, right where your cursor is by that bridge. There's some deep holes right there. When I say deep, they're probably like six feet deep now. And then, oh, wow. and then there's a, a water that's a foot deep just right next to it, and it just drops okay. off into the, um, into those deep holes. So, and for all my fly fishermen that watch this show, that's a, that's a nice little place that you can actually, there's a boat ramp right here on the canal. You can actually get out and wade this river and you can actually get some fishing yeah. in there too. All the way up, you could, you could wade all the way up the river, keep going up river. You could keep wading all the way up to Knoxville Falls. You know, you could find places to get out there and you could probably walk the river uh, quite, you could go back down a little bit. That's, uh, you're getting close to, uh, there's Knoxville Falls or Weaverton right Falls, we call it. Yeah. It's a, uh, a rat, it's a, um, white water system. Mm. And then there's some more, as you see up, up there. It's just all riffles, all riffles. And, yeah. and just, Oh my God. Yeah. I don't know how people, like I sometimes see people with a jet boat, but usually it's in the springtime. You see them like going up this, this way. Yeah. There's some guys that fish up there by the three forty bridge and stuff like that. And there's really good fishing up there from what I understand. You just got to know what the hell you're doing. You got to be seasoned like you. Cause like that would be a great way to lose your. To just destroy your hull. Oh yeah. Now no, let's go up here a little bit farther to like Shepherdstown because I know some people like to fish up this way a little bit. Yeah, um, I fish up there. The, what What is the fishing like this time of year? Is this a place that you tell people like, "Hey, don't don't go out this way. It's kind of a waste of time." Or is there fishing opportunities this time of year? No, there's fishing up there, but I wouldn't try to run a jet boat up that way. Okay, but for kayaking um, and waiting. Yeah, up there you'll you'll start getting into ledge systems, rocks ledge system, rocky ledge systems that are uh, that run parallel with the river. Like Am I saying that right? right parallel. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, they're, they're running, but they're running north and south in the water, and and they're uh, a, a rocks uh, a ledge system that does that is really hard to read, and mm -hmm. uh, usually you're on top of it before you uh, before you even know it. Let me see if I can find an example of one here. I know. Here we go. Uh, uh, there we go. Like this thing right here. Yeah, but if that thing was going north and south, yeah, something like that. Because this one, this one's it, going. Yeah. Before you know it, you're on top of it, and it, they're very hard to read in the water, um, because they're so narrow. Because I I know people some some of our listeners actually do fish up near Shepherdstown area right yeah. up here. And That's where this I was is a in this summer. Bar. Oh, really? I mean, I'm sorry. This this fall this this spring. Yep, yeah, I'd fish up there a little bit. So why would you pick that in the spring versus like any other time of year? Well, that's where the fish were. Oh, well, fair enough. <laughs> the fish, uh, the fish moved up that way. Um, and, uh, there's just a heavy concentration of fish. Now, Very that, heavy concentration. 
is that just time on the water? Because like Shepherdstown versus Brunswick versus you know down near Seneca, that's a ton of distance to travel. Like, is that just you having experience time on the water to know like okay, Shepherdstown in the springtime is probably better than in the summertime. Yeah, well, I got burned a couple times fishing before I um I was able to uh, go up towards Shepherdstown and start catching fish. Um, so Brunswick was fishing really well. Uh, just before, um, you know, late March, uh, early, early April. And then we had like a high water event. And then the, um, and as the water was falling, I was still fishing out there, you know, and I was catching some, uh, some nice fish and, uh, all of a sudden there was nothing. It was a hmm. ghost town from Edwards Ferry, Seneca, let's say Seneca all the way up, uh, past Dickerson. That's, it was a ghost town. That's weird. And, um, you know, and that's where, where this year I kind of believe you have residential fish and you have transient fish and those residential fish, they're few and far between They're They're the minority of the fish. The majority of fish are transient. They move constantly. So there's some, I bet you that live with only in the distance of Edwards Ferry to White's Ferry, let's say five, six miles and they never leave. That's, it's that's what I think. It's so crazy to think about that, though, about this river system. And you're thinking about fish making these massive moves. Because when you're thinking that, you're thinking like a big Lake Murray, or you're thinking of a place like the ocean or the Chesapeake Bay where you have fish that migrate. But they'll do this on the freaking, on the Potomac River, the Ever Potomac. Like, you'll have small enough move that distance. It's nuts. There's a guide I know. Um, he's a well-known guide on the Susquehanna River. He's, um, and uh, sometimes if I have a question, I'll, I'll, I'll call him or I'll, if I see him, I'll, I'll talk to him uh, at, the, at the boat ramp at the mornings up on the Susquehanna. And he's used numbers like 40 miles that they'll travel. 40 miles? 40 miles. That's he's insane. dead serious. Dead serious. And he would know. And I think that's what makes a river so hard because if you're thinking about that, and again, so like a lake or a pond, you can walk around it or you can walk around more of it. A river, man, you're pretty much, if you're bank fishing, you're stuck where you're at. And there's not a lot of places to go. You need a jet boat or a kayak or something like that to be able to explore these mm -hmm. places, to be able to get to the juice and stay on them. Well, the Shenandoah is still fishing real well, from what yeah. I understand. And the Monocacy River, there's hammers in there. I know a really? guy, a friend of mine, he caught one that was 21 inches uh, three or four days ago up in there. A smallmouth? Yeah. Shh. Middle of the summer. Caught it on top the water bait. Let me try to find In the that. mornings. Uh, five seconds. He has a around. video. He has a video out of him catching that fish. He's got a um, he's got a podcast or not a podcast. He's got a YouTube channel. It's a small YouTube channel. It's called uh, um, Read Laction. Uh, Read Read. Uh, what is it? It's his name's Brian Reed. And um, here I'll pull it up. I don't want to say. It. And and it, there's a picture of him uh, or there's video of him catching that fish. Um, hold on, let me let me pull him up here. Brian, I don't want to give uh, Brian uh, the wrong. Um, oh, here we go, Brian Reed. Yeah, he might be watching this right now. If it's if it's uh, able to be watched, hey, Brian or if you're just Reed. No, we're not, we're not live. So it's just it's just okay. Us. Eid. Yep. Um, let me uh, let me pull up his. Uh, let me pull up. Uh, read. Oh yeah. Read lax. Read laxation outdoors. He yeah. He played off his name. So it's Brian Read laxation. No, it's just Read laxation outdoors. That's his YouTube channel. R e e d l a x a t i o n. He does a pretty good job of uh, filming his, uh, his, he does everything by himself. Can you able to pull it up? Read. Laxation. Uh, there Out. we go. Yep, there it is. That one right there, that's his fish. He said he caught 30 that day. And this is on the Monocacy River. Yeah. Yep. Look at the size of that thing. Um, 
uh, was I going to say? Oh, you were asking about how how do you know where to, uh, where the fish are going to be? Uh, one of the positive things about uh, where where I'm fishing or where I do fish is uh, Dam Four. The fish can't get above Dam Four, hmm. so the fish can only swim so far. And when you can't find them, you just keep going up the river until you find them. Are you are you talking Dam Fours and I think Big Slack? No, Dam Four is just above uh, Shepherdstown and Sharps Shepherdstown, West Virginia, and Sharps Sharpsburg, Maryland. Shepherdstown and Sharpsburg. Okay, so that's Dam. I must be taking a Dam. You're taking yeah. a Dam Five, right? <laughs> this one right here is that Dam Four. I have no idea. That's uh, so. This is this is Guardsgate Wall. And let's see. So this is Mercersville right here. Uh huh. Keep going down. Where is uh? Yeah, that's that was Dam Four. So that was Dam Four. Yeah, right there. Okay, so you got all this water all the way up here. That's nuts. You get so but they much but they like this but but they'll stop below there around Shepherdstown. Okay. So there's, there's some really good habitat in there. So there's a dam just below Shepherdstown too? No. Because there's dam oh, five. Well, yeah, there was. There was one time. There's dam yeah. three. Dam three doesn't exist anymore. It's just a it's it, there it's a uh it's in ruins. Okay, yeah. That's why I was I was thinking like there was one that they blew up. So that's dam three they blew up. Got it. They have dam three and then there's dam two, which is down by Seneca Creek, and that's in ruins as well. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So yeah, so that that is the one thing that that's really true is with Dam Four and Five still in place, it does limit like how far up they can go. And there's mm -hmm. also a little wing dam um, up near like, Williamsport. I need to actually have you up in my country too, and you could fish there because you could probably get a boat into um, Conakajig Creek up there because that's some. Oh yeah, fishing. man, that place is that place is uh, uh, supposed to be really good fishing. It's absolute fire. Uh, the yeah. flathead are, are really an issue right now, but I know people do like to catch them. But there, are, there are some big ones up here, flathead wise. I think I think people are keeping their fair uh, fair share of flatheads too. I they think um, pe pe people like them, which they should because they're because they taste good. They taste good, and, and they fight. They fight, and they're here. Like at this point, they're here. What yeah. are you going to do about it? Uh, but speaking they're of that, fish. Like, like how? What are, are you catching them at all? This since last time we talked. I've just been focusing on bass. I've just been fishing bass um, or smallmouth. Uh, you know, the, the fish has been pretty good up around um, Lander as well. Lander boat ramp. Okay. Be speaking of catfishing, because there's some pretty good uh, flathead up that way. When did you make, when do you make the shift away from focusing from more catfish uh, trips to just purely bass? I usually do it with kids. Okay uh the the flathead um and then they can be hit or miss too in the holes really so, yeah so we go and um we're catch, we're at least catching bluegill and stuff like that okay gotcha yeah and it's then, so weird and then sometimes you'll actually catch a in some of these spots where i catch bluegill there's there's largemouth in the trees and stuff and you'll catch some um largemouth from time to time on that um uh, ultralight tackle crappie fishing how's that going this year you know, I found the crappie at one point in time. There uh, we go. I found some at uh, uh, near um, Dickerson Power Plant. Oh, really? Yeah, but I, I was um, I've been bass fishing, so I never really went back and tried to focus on them. But I, they were there. Oh man, come on, man! You get you get yeah. you gotta be able to take advantage of that when you find them. Yeah, they, they were there because um, because I caught them uh, by accident at first. So Dickinson uh, power plant. That's Dickerson, uh, that, that area has been hot too for smallmouth. I, I remember back when I was a kid and the old timers talked about Dickerson being an absolute just monster place in the wintertime when that power plant was working. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's like still good, but it, you know, it's, it's like a seasonal thing. It's a, uh, uh, you know, in the wintertime it can be good. Um, it just happens when they move in there and uh, there's been some largemouth in there recently. Really? Yeah. Like nothing how much nothing to write home about, but I mean we're catching largemouth along with smallmouth. What is the depth? What is the average depth of this river where this where the Monocacy actually dumps into it? Oh like, man, I, that water, what three feet maybe? Really? Okay. Yeah. And right now it's even lower. Uh there's areas where um you you probably should be on plane 
um, when you're going through there because you'll hit bottom. That's crazy because you think with the minoxy dumping in, like that would be deeper. Yeah, no, it's bad. It's bad in there. That's nuts. That's absolutely nuts. So then where do you think, I mean, going forward, like from now until let's say like October 1, when is the fishing going to start heating up to you? Do you think it's going to be like mid-September, late September that the fishing is yeah, going to start getting Yeah, mid to late hot? September. We need more water though. When, when we get some rain and the water comes up, we'll have days really? that, that are just awesome. And then you were, you were uh, speaking to that. You were talking about earlier, you were starting to talk about spinner baits. Mm -hmm. and you're asking about um, chatter baits and spinner baits. This spring really opened my eyes up to, I, I probably mentioned this before on here. Um, sometimes these smallmouth will, will be attracted to the chatter bait more than the spinner bait. Hmm. Like you could throw and throw and throw that spinner bait and they won't touch it. You'll throw a chatter bait behind the spinner bait and they'll hit it. That's crazy. Yeah. And, uh, um, chatter baits, uh, three eighth ounce to a half ounce, depending on how, how fast the water's moving, you know, but usually you can get away with a three eighth ounce. And to me, that's uh, what and then, fishing con. that really and does. And the, 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 the Z man, I use those as Z man, Z man elites. You could use those jackhammer ones. You can use, uh, uh, the regular original Z mans as well, but those tend to be uh pretty good uh, chatter baits for um, the river. Problem with the, the the jackhammer from a guide's perspective is how expensive they are to try to keep the boat stocked with them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. like, oh, I don't throw those. <laughs> We're not throwing those. Those are just those are just too expensive. I mean, I, I um I do throw those lucky craft lures with people. But we're not throwing them. Uh, if, if we're throwing, usually if you're throwing spinner baits or those chatter baits, you're throwing up into cover, right? You're throwing up mm -hmm. into uh, some type of um, rocky situation or something like that. Uh, and those chatter baits, man, they snag easy. So no, uh, spinner baits are a different story. They somehow uh, there's miracles that happen on the river when those things come out of trees. You're like, oh my gosh, they just came out of that tree, <laughs> or they're in, in a they're in a limb, or they're on a limb, ten feet in the air. They just come right out of the tree. When does topwater season like end? Are we still in a good topwater by right now? Yeah, I, I think it's going to get better though as the water cools down. I'm telling you, man, mm. at 80 degree water they they just uh, they become picky, and um, once that water gets down and it, it it's you know once it goes below 80 and and we know it's never going back up this fall, and there's no way of it ever reaching 80 degrees and it's down to 75, starts creeping down to 70. They'll go nuts, especially if the water comes up a little bit. How fast does that happen? How fast is that water going to drop 10 degrees? Is it going to be something that happens like in a week or is it going to take like a month for it to slowly get no, down? No, it'll take a few weeks for it to once it drops because it can come back up. We, 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 have, to, we have to start, uh, you know, the days are going to start getting uh, shorter and the nights will get longer. And I pay, I pay attention to the, the nighttime, temp, uh, nighttime temperatures more than daytime temperatures, winter and hmm. summer. Because we know the water's going to heat up during the day, right? Because yeah. of the, the sun. But, you know, the temperature determines how low it's going to um, drop in, at nighttime. You know, I mean, uh, if it's only, if it's 75 degrees at night in the summertime, that water temperature's not coming down very far if it's 80 degrees. It's not coming, probably not coming down at all. But if we get a night, if you get a night, like we, we've had recently some nights, remember? They're in the high 50s, low 60s. Yeah. The fishing was really good. Mm -hmm. No, I, I remember that too. Like, and it was so crazy because it was like a hundred degrees and all of a sudden we get these like crisp nights just like yeah, that. Yeah, this like third or fourth day was awesome. When do you think, and I know some, everyone has their own opinion on this, the fish start realizing the fall is coming. Do you think it's the first day that the light gets like a little bit shorter? Is there some kind of cue that you think they, they, they're looking at? Is it the first frost of the year? Like when I do you think, think they, fish I think. I think they know because the temperature just keeps falling gradually slow, you know, slower. It, it's falling, uh, every week it's maybe losing five degrees and it's not coming back. And you're right to, what did you just say? Something about the, uh, the, the first daylight. Frost. Yeah, yeah. The daylight it, and the first frost. Yeah. Yep. But nighttime temperatures are important. I'm finding that out the longer I do this. They determine the water. They're going to determine the water temperature for that for that next day. 
I'm going to make a note of that because that's something I've always thought of, like fishing grassy places. Like, you know, when the fall bite's starting to happen, as soon as you notice aquatic vegetation starting to die back, because aquatic vegetation, like grass or anything else, it responds first to the shorter days, like the daylight coming and, and, and really having those later, longer nights versus the days. And so when you start seeing that vegetation start to pull back and die off, then it's like, all right, it's happening right now. The, the yeah. turns start to happen. Oh, they probably, um, the, I'm sure they, they understand that too. When they start seeing the vegetation, the grass, I mean, there's, there's a lot of grass in the river right now and that's going to play uh, wreak havoc with us fishing when it starts dying off and starts floating down the river. The jet boats don't do well in uh, grassy and leafy situations. It pretty much the, crippled them. The good news though, is with all that vegetation, we've had a fantastic, spawn class and all mm -hmm. those bait fish and stuff that are there so once that starts dying back those fish are going to be chowing oh yeah they're going to be yeah they're going to be uh crushing those um those little uh those little bait fish or w whatever some of them are probably bass some of them are largemouth bass uh i don't you know when they're so small i don't i don't know how it's not that easy to tell until they get about what four inches five inches long then you can start yeah. telling that they're largemouth and smallmouth how do you, you you hit on something real? I really want to hit on before uh, before we go for today. When the grass starts pulling back and you have all that floating vegetation, does that limit what type of baits you can throw? Yeah, effectively, yeah, because um, you're going to probably have to switch over to some uh, some plastics. You're going to want to switch over to plastics, and then you're going to have to pick your spots a little bit, uh, um, be a little bit more pickier with where you go. Cause you're going to okay. try to find spots where there's not as much uh, vegetation floating down the river. Gotcha. 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 No, yeah. that's, that's good stuff. Cause yeah, that, that time of year is coming the best time of year for being on the river, that, that October to November time frame. we're getting, I think to one of the awesome, the best times to go out there. Just have oh, yeah, man. It, deer season's what the ninth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it opens up September 9th. So, it's, but, uh, it's coming. Hey, those, uh, those spinner baits for anyone or talking about spinner baits. Mm -hmm. The, um, so once I get away from these one, one uh, quarter ounce, one fourth ounce ones, I go to three eighth and a half ounce, depending on you know, the, the water, the speed of the, uh, how fast the water's moving. And um, those spinner baits, they're very, I've said this before too, they're very situational. So just because you're not catching fish doesn't mean they don't work. They're in the wrong situation. On a river system, the water has to be uh, uh, coming up. It has to be high, meaning uh, three feet isn't high right now in the river. But let's say we get six feet, that the gauge reaches six feet, um, the fish will be on the shorelines. And that's when you start throwing spinner baits or chatter baits. And do, you, do you throw a trailer hook or do you throw any kind of trailer on there when you use it? The spinner baits? No, 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 no trailer, like a plastic trailer. But yes, uh, I have trailer hooks of, um, with me. and. Um, those damn fish will hit these things and it looks like they headbutt them sometimes and stuff and they just won't hook themselves, right? You've seen that, I'm sure. Have you ever seen yeah. them grab the blade of a spinnerbait? Oh I've seen God. them grab a hold of the blade and just start, uh, you're reeling them in and they just, and they just let go of it. it and, um, insane. yeah. And, uh, but so that's where their trailer hook comes into play. But, but this is weird on a, um, chatterbait. I feel like it needs a, it needs a, a plastic trailer. Do you feel that way about a chatterbait? I really do because it's not, it's a secondary action that that trailer produces. And the fact that you have so much, it's, it's vibration versus flash. I think the reason you're throwing a spinnerbait is more for the flash and the skirt yeah. secondary with a chatterbait. It's all vibration and you want that, that undulating movement and stuff. Yeah. It's called a vibrating jig for a reason, right? I, exactly. And something you hit on is always have a trailer hook. Like I get that there are some people that just don't want them. I, I will never forget the time that my brother and I were fishing our first uh, college tournament and we were fishing this grass bed on the Potomac and we fished through it and we're getting nipped. We didn't know what it was. And, mm -hmm. we, and he, he, I kept saying, it's a perch, it's a perch, it's a perch. He dug into the box and found one trailer hook. It was a rusty old trailer hook. He put it on his chatterbait, went back through there. He caught three bass that got as close to, I think it was like 15 pounds mm -hmm. all on the back hook. Yeah. If we didn't have that back hook, we wouldn't have gotten any of them. And we all thought like, oh, they're just perched, just tearing our trailer up. So guys, it just, it's, you can get some cheap ones. I'm not saying you have to go buy expensive ones, but keep a small no. pack of them in your boat just in case. Yeah. And then, you know, um, size them correctly, how, how big you want, because there's some big trailer hooks. Oh, some yeah. of them look long on certain baits. Uh, the bait might be too, too small for them. 
But uh, yeah, those, uh, I mean, I can't preach that enough about spinner baits. Some people can make them work on a regular basis, I guess. And they use them a lot. Some of these older pro uh, tournament pros um, swear by spinner baits and they'll, they'll, they'll throw them. Uh, they live and die by spinner baits, right? I'm mm -hmm. sure you've heard of people that, that are like that, mm -hmm. but I'm telling you, uh, you know, at least on a river system, high water when, uh, um, and you know, um, and depending on the clarity, the blades matter. Now, so, have you ever used white, white blades or chartreuse blades or anything like that? You Color know what? Blades? I only, um, ever really throw, um, people do. I've had people get on the boat and they do, they're catching fish with them, but, um, I only ever throw the, the gold and silver ones and okay. it really doesn't matter. I've never really seen a difference in which one, um, is really catching more fish than the other one. As long as they're the same size spinner bait with the same size blades. So when we went up to Lake Champlain, holy crap, those fish will destroy blades. And when you talk oh, really? about them just biting the blades, they hit it like it's somebody that just went after their wife. I mean, they hit <laughs> it with such freaking, it's insane. Like th those fish up there showed me that small sometimes I think they just hit out of anger because they will just truck a blade and you'll come back with a war eagle or striking whatever your preference is. And it's just mangled up completely. And it's, it's a huge difference. I think it's because that water is so gin clear and it's so deep. When you have a white blade or yellow blade ripping across their head, it, it's just the visual of it. It's a color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But those, yeah, those spinner baits, they're, they're like I said, I mean, I can't, I can't stress it enough. They're situational. And if um, you don't have the right situation, uh, they're just not going to produce the um, uh, fish that you want them to. And spinner baits catch big fish. Oh, a hundred percent. They do. They catch massive you know, ones. You know, small mouth, but you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of small mouth out there trying to find their way in the world and they're little guys and they'll hit these big spinner baits. That's just because they're mean fish. You know, they're just, mm -hmm. they're just aggressive, but um, majority of the fish you're going to catch on a spinner bait are going to be just really quality fish. When does the crankbait come into play? Uh, in the arsenal? same, in the same conditions, high water. Okay. Um, throwing on the shorelines. And that's when I know for a fact, you'll catch fish on a crankbait. Any other time? Um, I think it's day to day, like in the summertime, just a day to day situation it, and whether or not they're, they're going to, um, react to something like that, but I know in high water, they will. Yeah. And then, and then with that bait, you know, you want some clarity in the water so they can, they can see it. They can see that, it at least moving through the water. I mean, that's when I'd want to throw it. Otherwise you could throw a swim bait or something else. Like if you have a little bit of chalkiness to the color of the water, mm -hmm. You can really wreck them with a chartreuse crankbait or something like that. Um, or when they're just nipping it. Like that's the thing about trailer hook baits, like a jerk bait or crank bait. Like if they're just swatting out a spinner bait or a chatterbait guys, that's when you switch over to Trebs. Yeah. They um and and they'll they'll nail a um crankbait up here in the river. Uh, but the uh spinner baits, the blades, the willow leaf blades, I throw those as if, if there's any clarity in the water whatsoever. Okay. I'm going to throw willow leaf blades. And if the water's starting, if it's, if it's borderline dirty to like muddy water, I've caught them in just legit muddy water with, um, Colorado blades. You want blades wow. that thump real well. And you want to throw it right up on the uh, shoreline and pretty much drag it in the water. I gotta get more confidence with Colorado blades. I really do. You've been throwing the willow leaf. I really throw willow leaf blades most of the time. And I know like you look at Jason Christie and some of these big pros that will throw these like like half ounce silver dollar like colorado blades on like a one ounce spinner bait and they'll chuck yeah. it and just like grind it on the bottom uh -huh. and their rods like doubled over because the blade's so big and they they have success with it but it's just like i don't know i don't have the confidence to throw that and i think it's just because i have to get in the good situations <laughs> where you can actually catch them doing it mm -hmm. yeah um and then right now also those flukes are still playing a playing a big uh big part of catching fish you want flukes yeah. Now, is fluke fishing, isn't it just going to get better as we get farther along yeah. into the fall? Yeah, well, because, um, I mean, a fluke is kind of like a soft jerk bait, right? I mean, you can throw it out and just let it fall, and you can just bounce it on the bottom like you would a, a, a Cinco or something like that, and you can just pop it through the water, mm -hmm. um, especially clear water. Clear water where you can see it from a distance, and you can start working it in the water, and you can see it um, dart left and right and stuff like that. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And oh, uh, that's awesome. they they seem to uh, 
uh, really um, react to those baits pretty well. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a time of year. We're getting there to the, the best time of year. It's freaking awesome. Um, where can everyone buy products? Tell them about your online store so they can come. I have an online store you. called SWFA Baits. They can go to SWFABaitTackle.com and uh, check out what I have right now. I'm going to be getting um, more some, more uh, products in uh, in the next uh, month. Like I said, Lucky Craft Lures is going to be one of them. I'll have uh, Strike King um, uh, uh, crankbaits available. And bandit, bandit crankbaits available. And these 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 um, crankbaits and jerk baits aren't going below like five six feet in the water because because the type of water I fish in, I'm not throwing crankbaits that dig ten feet down. Yeah, you're not throwing a twenty just, foot diver. Yeah, no, I I just don't I don't have those. And then guys, again, as always, you know, link in the episode description down below to all of his information. Please book a trip with this guy this fall. You better hurry up though, because he's booking up fast. The river is going to get better and better as we get closer to that magical time of October, November. So please get out in the water. And then guys, if you could please like and subscribe to the channel, I want this thing to get up to over 20 likes. That would really help us out in the algorithm. And we're going to see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Hey, that, hey, the Potomac River looks good this year. It's been looking good. And we have really, we've had really good weather and it's supposed to, the water's supposed to be this low this time of year. That's just the way it is. It's summertime. Mm -hmm. So, uh, don't think it all, you know, the rain, I, I said, we need more water, but uh, it'll come. But right now, I mean, the river's great. Yep. It's clear. It, winter's it's, coming. Fall's coming. Yeah. Winter's coming. And there's, there's a lot of vegetation on the river, uh, which means soon enough, these fish will have nowhere to hide and, uh, it'll be all out war with those uh small mouth in the uh in the bait fish so what time when do you think that's going to start happening you think in october one or mid-october late late september late september yeah and i'll tell uh, you what, the first the first real rise we have a good rise i'm not talking about a sloppy muddy horrible mess of a rise because a hurricane has you know hit off our coast but just something that brings the water up from three feet to five and a half, six feet and over like three day period, four day period, they're going to be crazy. Absolutely nuts. Mm -hmm. uh, they are. And I'm so looking forward to it. It's, it's going to be fun and yeah. the fishing just going to get better. And that's what's so crazy about river fishing compared to like lakes. It's just going to get so much better between now and Thanksgiving. It's not even funny. Yeah. Hey, real quick too. Someone had something in here. I read a comment. Did you read that? I don't know if you read the comment. I think I, I saved it. Let me see well, here. Which episode? And I can get it up. You know what, man? I don't even know the episode. Um, were you I in it? Oh, yeah, yeah, I was in it. Um, <laughs> asking about, first off, someone asked about safety gear. Do you remember seeing that comment? Uh, five seconds and I'll find that comment for you. Safety gear comment. I, and I don't know how to answer it other than, because I don't really remember the comment other than there was something about safety gear. Um, I use uh, auto inflatable life jackets. Uh, they're a lot more comfortable than your um, uh, regular life jackets. Uh, they're even more comfortable than the ones that the guys wear kayaking. But I don't know if those guys are supposed to wear those audible inflatable ones when they kayak. I wanted to answer that guy's question or have uh, we could answer it for him. No, we can answer for him right now. I'm trying to figure out where it is. New boat. Oh, the gear. Oh, and here's another question. This guy said gear used would be helpful, the rod and everything. I don't. I, I think we've gone over that before. Just mention it again. So the rod and reels that that you should be using for river smallmouth is a medium light seven foot rod. Um, the brand is up to you. Um, I sell them, but I, I sell a brand uh, uh, that a guy by the name of Steve Fogel Backyard Custom Rods mix. Um, you want medium light seven foot. Uh, I have fast action. You want a 1000, I guess you could go up to 2500 series, but 1000 to 2000 series reel. And like I said, the braided line, you want braided line attached to fluorocarbon. And that braided line um, should be around 25 pound test. And then your uh, fluorocarbon should be somewhere on eight pounds. And then if you're going to be throwing spinner baits and you don't want to use a bait caster, go to a medium size rod, seven foot, and throw. Um, a 2500 series use a reel that's about 2500 series and i guess some people go to three but i think 25 is plenty enough because of the bigger bigger baits and you can throw crankbaits chatterbaits spinnerbaits 
Um, you could throw the larger flukes, stuff like that with them. Oh, topwater baits, those whopper ploppers, uh, larger poppers, and use uh, uh, that same braid and use uh, monofilament line. I like monofilament line for uh, for those bigger baits. And I use 10 to 12 pound monofilament line, just clear line. And What uh, type of knot do you use? For the, uh, I use a, uh, was it a cinch knot? Cinch knot. Cinch knot. And then for the uh, tying the lines together. There's great videos online, YouTube. Maybe yeah. I'll do one eventually. And it's, um, I just use the double uni knot, man. There's only three knots I use. It's the double uni knot, that cinch knot, and um, the uh, Palomar knot. That's Palomar. It. I mean, we're landing a uh, four foot muskie with a cinch knot on the Potomac River on light tackle yeah. gear. So, the, those knots, and unless you like some other knots or you want to challenge yourself to tie something else, that's fine. But th those knots are tried and true, 100%. I yeah. mean, I, I would bet money th that they win you money in a tournament, too. You you're just not going to uh, – it it's there's really nothing else you need to look for. Yeah, for, for everyone at home, if you're just starting out, double uni knot start there if you're going to do braid to, to a leader material. And then I would suggest at some point learning the FG knot um, just practicing it, getting better with it because uh, it does. It, it, that, that's a tiny knot, right? That's to go it's, through those micro guides. Yeah, it's a tiny knot, okay, so yeah. you can spool up a lot more fluorocarbon onto your reel, and it'll cast through the reel guides. It's a it's a harder knot to tie, but the point of it is that you would have like ten to fifteen feet of fluorocarbon versus like three feet of fluorocarbon. That way, you can spool it up onto your reel, and then every time you cast, it will go through the the, the eyes a lot easier. And then, hey, that monofilament line, why, why I'm saying monofilament and some people use fluorocarbon. When you get on a lake, I guess there's a lot more detail too. There's a lot mm -hmm. more other options because uh, the uh, fluorocarbon will allow your, your crankbait to sink, go down a little bit further, right? It can, depending on how heavy it is. But the monofilament, it floats. I mean, we're, we're fishing in four feet of water, five feet of water, sometimes six. And uh, we don't need stuff grabbing rocks. You just want to be just above everything. So those crankbaits, that's all you need. For the crankbaits gotcha. and the spinner baits and stuff like that. And I also believe it acts as a shock absorber because monofilament yeah. stretches. And if you have about a rod's length of monofilament on there and they hit that, you're not going to rip their their lips off when they grab it. Mm -hmm. You know, because that rod's going to bend pretty good because it's a uh, medium, medium action rod. And that's the key too, is it's the whole system. It's not just one thing, it's not just the line, it's not just the rod, it's not just the hook, it's everything put together has to work as a system. Yeah. And then uh, once you have that fish on, a lot of people make this mistake and um, I, I, I see it a lot. Uh, they'll try to reel that fish up as far up to the rod as they can. And um, that's how you lose fish because then the, the rod and the reel can't do their job anymore. The only thing you need to be doing once you get that rod, once you, you need to reel that fish up to about a rod's length of line, seven, six, six to seven feet of line, leave it in the water and the rest of it should be in the rod and on the spool. And um, the rod and reel are doing their doing their job. It, it it can pull drag. It can it can bend correctly, and then you can just manipulate the fish into the net or however you're going to land it. The other thing too is you're supposed to use the drag system on your reel to handle those fish. Like that's so important that you mm -hmm. use that drag system. I mean, you still lose you fish. But... Oh yeah. Yeah, that's going to happen. Like, that's just part of the game. That's what makes it so much fun. But uh, yeah, like w when you were using this lighter line, guys at home, make sure that you get your drag set appropriately to where that helps tire them out, that you're not just trying to manhandle them in. When you manhandle them in on that lighter stuff, that's when you're going to get hurt. And then I had another thing that came to mind real quick. I know, Thomas, you want to get out of here. Wow, but hey, these, these spinner baits, um, I don't care what they're, I think, I believe. Maybe maybe Thomas will will agree to me uh, and, and you know at some level. But I think these these War Eagle spinner baits. I know at one time they were making them themselves, and now someone else bought them. But I think these are probably some of the best spinner baits ever made. Oh, they are. And yeah, um, I love War Eagle. And these spinner baits, I'm telling you what, don't rely on these things. If you're catching fish on them and they keep bending and you keep bending them back, man, trash these things after so long. Take the blades off of them. Take whatever you can. If you can remove the skirts off of them and reuse mm -hmm. them, but trash them because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen is you're going to lose the biggest fish of your life on one of these things because he's going to snap it. And the only thing you're going to get back are the blades and they're probably going to hit you in the face. Uh, like but, they also, have made. but also I think that's what makes them so good is those, those, that wire is so thin that it's mm -hmm. such good vibration when you're fishing. them. Yeah. 
but that, uh, especially people that, you know, on the river that are tournament fishing, uh, if you've never really thought about this, man, get rid of these things after they bend a few times, especially if a channel catfish, it's one of these oh, on the yeah. Potomac and bends it all to hell. Um, consider it retired and go find yourself a, a, a replacement because, uh, you're going to get a big small mouth on here and they're going to break the wire. They'll That's break this thin point. wire on this bait. It's incredible what they can do. Hmm. Hey everyone, Fishing the DMV is a fast growing business with thousands of viewers each week listening in to this show. And in 2023, we're looking to expand and grow our business. And in order to do that, we need to bring on some sponsors. If your business is interested or you know someone that might be interested in sponsoring Fishing the DMV, please reach out to me at fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Again, that's fishingthedmv at gmail.com. We're looking for a couple of unique sponsors to come on and help us grow this business in 2023. That's a really good point. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. And again, guys, so one comment I've had gotten into the past is like, why would I go with this bait or this bait? So example is the Senko is a great example. Why would I go with the Senko versus a Yamamoto or I'm sorry, versus like a, um, a Yumdinger, things of that short. What is the purpose? If you're a tournament angler where you absolutely want to maximize your chance of catching a fish, you're going to use the Senko. Even though you're, it's going to cost, you know, one Senko per fish you catch because you're going to get it destroyed. It is a higher quality product. They are good baits. They are good baits, but if you're a budget guy, 100%, go to Dick's Sporting Goods, go buy a pack of 2,000 yum dingers. That's fine. That's probably the better thing. It's the same thing with your spinnerbait. If you get certain spinnerbaits on the market with that thicker wire, it doesn't have the same vibration. Granted, it might last longer, but there is a key advantage to throwing that War Eagle or that Yamamoto Senko. It's, it, it's not probably the most financially smart decision, so make sure you're, you don't tell your wife, but it does, yeah. I think, put the odds in your favor. Yeah, but uh, telling you, man, these these War Eagle spinner baits, they're uh, they're pretty good. And what's what's that brand of, of War Eagle? That that more compact one? What is it called? It's just a quarter ounce. It's just a quarter I, ounce one. I've had them for a couple of years. I have several of them. I've just taken them out of the packages, and they just hang in my garage. Uh, okay. They're quarter ounce um, War Eagles. Quarter ounce War Eagles. Cool. With the small with the smaller uh, blades on them, and that smaller silver uh, bullet looking head. Awesome. And is that something that they can get in, in the stores now, like your store now? Um, you will be able to okay, eventually. Cool. Um, I'm, I'm still working on it. I opened that store up in July and um, I do have an account with Lucky Craft and stuff like that. So um, I'll be getting those soon. But the uh, the War Eagles, I can get them through a distributor as well. I, I saw it recently where I can um, access these. Awesome. That's so cool. Uh, guys, like Spinnerbait Fishing is a lot of fun. Um, shop at his store. Please really, really help support him. Uh, it's so nice that he gets to come on every month that we would be able to actually go through this and give everyone like up to date information. And, and please book a guide trip with him, or just reach out and talk to him if you want to. Hey, all these baits and stuff that I that, that I have, I use in my guide trip. I'm slowly putting them on my website, my uh, retail website. I mean this this um, slows your or speeds up the curve of catching fish, um, like on the Potomac or something like that, or the Susquehanna. Cause you're buying stuff that works and you know, it works. I'm using them and I'm taking people out that fish once or twice a year and they're catching fish with this stuff. And then if you're someone that fishes a lot more than that, um, you'll do well. And that's the thing is we're trying to save you guys money by watching this right now. You are getting a pulse of what's going on in the river right now. So you don't have to go to Walmart, Dick's Sporting Goods, Bass Pro Shop, wherever, and just buy a bunch of tackle that you don't need. So again, guys like this is really really good information you can't get this anywhere else please like and subscribe to the channel i really want to get this to 20 likes so please hit that like button it does help us in the youtube algorithm and also really try to follow jeff uh follow his youtube channel his facebook really try to go to his store really help him out and book a guide trip him with him again i'm again, on guys, instagram i'm on instagram too instagram i'm too. even uh, i'm not a celebrity but i'm on twitter <laughs> oh my goodness i'm, I'm not i'm not a celebrity so uh very few people see me on there and uh I have a few videos on TikTok. I'm going to start putting more out on TikTok too, just just because it's another uh, platform. He's another person that's going to fall to the dark lord of TikTok. My goodness. <laughs> Eventually, every grown man I know is going to have a TikTok. It's not good. It's not good that we're going this way. China's going to rule us all. <laughs> But yeah, Jeff, thanks again. No problem. I'm, I'm so happy that you're able to come on tonight. Um, guys, again, link in the episode description to all of his social, including where you can get in contact with him if you have any questions. And again, 
please like and subscribe to the channel because we are the fastest growing outdoor show in the greater DC metropolitan area. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.